Well, I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Eric Garman. I'm a trade development manager for the Oregon Department of Agriculture, um, representing Musada. I want to thank everyone that has that is joining us today um, on this webinar. I'm excited um, for the presentation, um, and I'm excited that you're all interested in the Canadian market. Um, we're going to try to make this as interesting and as um, productive as possible. Uh, I know that you're all fatigued from um, any sort of video chats or video webinars, so we're going to, again, make this, uh, this next hour hopefully very productive for you. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to um, make some quick introductions. Um, the uh, First of all, I'd like to introduce um, my partner um, from the California State Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, Josh Eddy. Um, also, I would, would like to introduce um, our WUSADA intern, uh, Lucas um, Farah. Hello. And in addition, um, I would also like to introduce our speaker for today, um, Evan Mangino. He's the agriculture attache for the USDA um, Foreign Agriculture uh, Services um, in the embassy at the US Embassy in Canada. And um, last but certainly not least, Naveen Zeet, who's our marketing specialist for the USDA in Canada as well. Um, before we get started, again, I wanted to just a couple of housekeeping um, items. Uh, wanted to let you know that we are shifting our um, we are shifting our dates for this project back a little bit into May. Um, so we will be following up next week with some more information about that. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself um, or Josh. And Josh, would you like to add anything else? Well, Eric, thank you so much. And everyone, thank you so much for joining. We look forward to working with you on this activity. And we look forward to um, Evan's great kind of overview of the market. Um, and just another housekeeping reminder, if you could please make sure to mute your line so we don't have any background um, until we get to the Q&A session, that would be great. Um, and Evan, I'd like to turn it over to you for a great discussion. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Josh. Um, and Good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to be here physically, if not virtually. Um, really appreciate the uh, the turnout this afternoon and we hope to have a, a, like, a, like Josh and like Eric said, a great conversation. Um, please at any time, if you feel like you have a question you wanna ask, just you know, feel free to raise your hand, speak up, pipe up. I am not shy and I am not gonna take any offense at being interrupted by any stretch of the imagination. You know, our whole role here is to help, you know, you guys get the most out of this type of an activity. And usually that comes from the, the specific questions you might have to ask that can oftentimes be of great value to everybody else on the line who might be sharing a similar question or a thought or an idea, but just didn't think to ask it. So I'm gonna share my screen with you all. And I know it's a PowerPoint and like Eric said, good God, one year into all this, we're still doing PowerPoints, we're still doing video everything. And I apologize, but I will try to make it as lively and engaging as humanly possible. Um, as Eric mentioned, my name is Evan Mangino. I am with the Foreign Ag Service. If you're not familiar with the Foreign Ag Service, I'll give you the quick 30 second spiel. Uh, we have 94 offices in 74 countries around the world. We are the Foreign Service Arm of the US Department of Agriculture and we exist to help promote US agricultural exports overseas. We do that by creating market access in countries where US products may have a hard time getting in or may not be able to get in. We help negotiate with those countries to create access for US products. We also do it through market development, market promotion activities. And so these are the kinds of activities that we would fund in collaboration with USADA and in collaboration with different associations like the US Grains Council or the California Strawberry Commission uh, to help promote US agricultural products, you know, broadly speaking, overseas, be it to consumers, to you know, buyers, brokers, distributors, the intermediaries, um, you name it, we pretty much can do it. And so we do a whole lot of work with WUSADA in the Canada market, as well as with uh, over 40 US agricultural cooperators that are active up here. And then for the foreign ag service in certain developing countries, we'll work with ministries of agriculture to help them be more effective you know, service providers to their agriculture sector, which helps US products get into that market further down the road because it sets the, the foundation for good international trade. All right, so. Uh, here in Canada, we tend to operate our marketing activities under two brands, English language and French language. So we have Taste USA for Anglophone Canada and the Prenez-vous aux états brand uh, for Francophone Canada. And these, this, these brands operate as an umbrella under which we you know, communicate directly to consumers 
to bring together multiple cooperators, multiple trade associations. And you know, on our websites and on our digital media channels, we will promote US agricultural products through recipe videos, through you know, re, you know, uh, reposting, amplifying, magnifying the voices of our agricultural trade you know, partners here in the market. And it's a way to kind of pull away from the red, white, and blue that can be a little bit grating for Canadian sensitivities. We'll talk a little bit about that further down the road. Uh, but also to, to, to bring folks together. And so there's a, a big uh, national produce show going on in two weeks time called the, the Canadian Produce Marketing Association's Fresh Week. And uh, during Fresh Week, you will see a ton of US fr um, fruit and vegetable producers and handlers and shippers exhibiting there. And for the cooperators that are you know, gonna have their own little booths at the show, it's a virtual show, we're putting them all into the Taste USA Pavilion. And so it's a way for us again, to like kind of bring everybody under the, the big tent of our activities to help defray some of the costs and help magnify the, the voices that are out there um, and kind of pull back a little bit from the embassy. And again, not that you have to pull back from the embassy, but not in every country does your association with the embassy carry the same kind of weight or the same kind of message that you want it to. So why are we talking about Canada this afternoon? Also, by the way, just as a full you know, measure of disclosure, I was born and raised in New Jersey. I tend to speak rather quickly. I'm really sorry. If anybody's having a hard time understanding me or if I'm going just a little bit too quickly, also please feel free to speak up because my natural inclination is just to say as much as I possibly can in a short amount of time to open it up for Q&A. Um, real quickly, why are we talking about Canada this afternoon? Canada is the, or in 2020, Canada was our number two agricultural export market valued at over $22 billion. And of that $22 billion, you will see that over 16.5 billion of it was high value added products. So consumer packaged goods, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, processed fruits and vegetables, meats, you name it. We are far and away the largest agricultural export market for US high value products that end up on a retail shelf or go directly into food service. Um, and these are the kinds of activities or the kinds of products I would say that really uh, create an additional economic benefit for US you know, producers because we're doing the value added back in the US, right? We're, we're putting the value into the product in the States and shipping it overseas. And you can see that Canada, even if it's our number two export market, or it was our number two export market overall in 2020, because we sold a whole lot of uh, pork and a whole lot of soybeans in China, once again, um, Canada remains our number one market for a lot of valuable products and a lot of things that are you know, being produced by folks like you on the call today, uh, snack foods, cereals, sauces and condiments, confectionaries and chocolates, pet foods, wine, spirits, beer, soft drinks, you name it. It's really kind of a remarkable thing. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can forward a little bit, jump down. You'll see this list here on the right-hand side and I'll get to this later, but this is 15 different categories of trade where we have more than $500 million a year in exports to Canada. And if you lower that bar to $250 million, we have over 31 categories of products that have over $250 million of exports to Canada every year. So you can see the Canadian market really is a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a vital, vibrant, valuable market. We are heavily connected uh, both on a production and on a sales level, and it goes both ways. We send about a billion dollars every week across the US-Canada border coming into and out of the United States with our Canadian trade partners. And it really is a great market for, for small companies to really kind of cut their teeth in uh, on the agricultural export side of things because you'll, we'll get to it in just a bit. Um, I just, before we you know, dive further into the specifics of the Canadian market, I'll give you the obligatory rundown on COVID up here. Um, where are things in Canada today? What should you be aware of? First and foremost, the border is closed. The border has been closed since you know, March 15th, 2020, uh, and it will be closed through at least April 21, 2021. Um, which is the, the next date for review. And I can tell you, it's going to be closed beyond then as well. Uh, you know, I'm not a, I am a bit of a gambler, but I would just say that I would not bet on the border being open before September 1, if I had to put, you know, business plans and put a process in place, uh, mostly because of the slow rate of vaccination in Canada and the rising in Canadian terms, the third wave that they're going through right now. Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you'll see that the Canadian case numbers are on the bottom there. And you see they had their first wave in the spring. It was much smaller than the US first wave. They had a big second wave uh, in the winter as the air got real dry and we're kind of you know, cresting into a third wave right now. 
And the Canadian vaccination campaign is far behind the United States campaign. Um, in Canada, I will say they do not face nearly the, the range of vaccination hesitancy that we are experiencing in the States. Uh, they are facing much more of a vaccine supply problem. And Canadian, you know, consumers, voters, whatever you want to call them, are a little, a little miffed with their government right now that they haven't done a better job of getting vaccines into the country so they can get shots into people's arms. So the Canadian government right now in Ontario, Quebec, the two most populous provinces in the whole country, are looking at different stages of kind of shutting down again, just because um, you know, things are as bad as they are and the rates are as high as they are right now. So with respect to the actual market and the way things are working out on the, the marketing side, I would say trade somewhat remarkably has not really varied all that much over this time. It's pretty astounding that because uh, you know, our countries acknowledge the importance of the border early on, we kept you know, commercial transportation moving pretty seamlessly and agricultural trade is not off in a noticeable way because of COVID. So if you were selling products into Canada in 2019, chances are you're probably still selling products into Canada in 2021. Food service, uh, with food service right now, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, Canadian food service has taken you know, quite a hit during COVID as has US food service. Um, you know, the, the rates we've seen, you know, uh, establishments already have closed up for good that will never be opening again. But the expectation is that, you know, once, you know, the, the vaccination campaign can really, you know, take hold and get people to a higher level of vaccination and then the, the, the rates start coming down and the cases start coming down, people will be returned to, will, uh, will return to restaurants and restaurant activity will pick up again. But I can tell you right now, um, most restaurants in Canada have been on a form of life support basically for the last year or so, just like in the States. It's not pretty, uh, but we hope that it comes back uh, once things return to a pre-pandemic type of environment. Labor shortages, something that Canadian uh, farmers, producers, and companies continue to struggle with, just like the U.S. at times, is access to labor. Canada imports about 60,000 what they call temporary foreign workers every year. And when that transportation across the United States or into the country gets disrupted by the lack of flights, it can be a big problem on the ground for Canadian producers, especially in the fresh fruit and vegetable sector. I can tell you right now, because they have to renew these contracts every year, it is on the minds of Canadian growers, but it does also continue to create opportunities for U.S. products that may be having, maybe have a better access to labor than Canadian producers do. Dang, pardon. All right, so back to uh, Canada as a high value market. One of the things that I would say is truly remarkable about our presence in this market is just the, the tremendous share that we hold in the market. You'll see in that top right hand corner there, there's a, a pie chart that shows who the, the competitors are in this market. And for you know most products, and I'm, I'm talking about pretty much everything but fresh fruits and vegetables, the United States is a dominant market player. And you can see as the total share of high value imports we have over 60% of the Canadian market locked down. So that means that Canadian consumers have a great appreciation for trust in and confidence in U.S. products. Retailers are very accustomed to handling U.S. products. They have great relationships with U.S. companies. The logistics and transportation line up really nicely for doing business in this market. So down here, you'll see this is our, our map of Canada. And if you're not so you can be forgiven as an American. I have to tell you, I came here as a diplomat, as a representative of the U.S. government. And when I first arrived here, I realized just how little I knew of Canada. And, you know, much like many Americans, it's so close. We feel like it's, you know, like a neighbor. But at the same time, one of the most important things I can ever convey to somebody looking at the Canadian market is that you not think of it as a 51st state. When you look at Canada, please, please, please be cognizant of the fact that they are... A market unto themselves. They are a nation unto themselves. Yes, and their 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 economy is closely tied, you know, inextricably tied to the U.S. economy in so many ways. Um, but you know, Canadians are fiercely Canadian and fiercely proud of being Canadian. And sometimes they will define themselves in opposition to the United States. Um, I can tell you right now that the mood up here is a lot brighter than it was in recent years, due to our political transition in the United States. We had had some pretty contentious moments during my tenure. I've been up here for four years and I can say that I came, I was posted to Canada before the 2016 election uh, and I arrived shortly after, um, you know, in early, late 2017. And it was, it was a, a, a no shortage of excitement, let's put it that way, for four years, including the renegotiation of the NAFTA, the NAFTA trade deal that we'll talk about as well. Um, Canadians did react strongly. There were times when their feelings were hurt. 
there were times when their national pride was wounded. And I say this not as a, a slight or as a political statement, um, but I say this to, to make you aware of the recent history of our bilateral relationship. I can say that Canadian consumers do, trans, do follow American politics far more closely than American consumers do. And it's something to be aware of that Canadians are usually tracking what happens in Washington DC more than they're tracking what happens in Ottawa, mostly because for their own interests and their own lives, it can have more consequence and more impact. Um, here on this map, you will see uh, the different colors that are on the map there are you know, reflective of population densities. And so you'll see the greater Toronto area listed down there and that's that big purple with the dark purple center. And then you'll see Montreal as well, which is the other kind of dark purple circle. Ontario and Quebec, those two big pieces of land right there kind of on the Eastern side of Canada, they represent about 60 plus percent of Canadian population and 60 plus percent of Canadian economic activity. If you are an English speaker as an American, your first stop is almost invariably going to be Toronto because that's where you have population density. That's where you have the English speakers. I will say, please, please, please do not shy away from Montreal. It is a tremendous market. It has over 4 million people in the greater Montreal area. There are a lot of opportunities to be had in Montreal. We have opened up an office in Montreal to help you succeed there, which is something that I think you should all take advantage of. Uh, Ms. Zarela Delibashi, who's not on the call this afternoon to the best of my knowledge, uh, she's our agricultural marketing specialist there and you'll get her contact information at the end. We'll happily walk you through any of the, the steps and hurdles you need uh, to clear in order to succeed in the Quebec market. But we talk about Quebec as a market that has been traditionally underinvested in by US companies because of the language barrier, because of the, the, the different culture and because of the different approach to doing business, which can be much more relationship oriented even than the rest of Canada, which can be more relationship oriented than the United States, which can be a little bit more transactional. Um, Quebec is a country with an economy the size of Vietnam and it borders four US states. It bears considering when you're looking at making your marketing plans, but you'd also not be for, you would also not be stepping out of line or out of past practice if you looked at the greater Toronto area first, simply because it has about 13 million people in the greater Toronto area between Toronto, Mississauga, Hamilton, the big you know, population center right there on the lake and also for you know, Western states that are in the Pacific Northwest or on the West Coast, Vancouver is another option. I will say this, even though Vancouver is a port city, it is not a functioning port city. When it comes to US products going in and out of Vancouver, things tend to go in over truck. And that's why we have these arrows here, really kind of defining where the, the main flows of you know, trade and commerce out of the US tend to enter into Canada. And you can see from the, the, the Toronto area, you've got things coming in across the bridge in Detroit, you got things coming in across bridges in Buffalo, you got a lot of access. And you know, the greater Toronto area is within a 16 hour driving radius of something like 60% of the US population. So there's a really good opportunity to move things in there. Uh, Montreal, again, really easy access, getting things overland into Montreal, oftentimes by train or by truck. When it comes to Vancouver, like I said, it's pretty much going in by truck north and south. Um, a really quirky thing about Canada, uh, they don't have an interstate commerce clause like we do in the United States. And so you can actually find Canadian provinces erect trade barriers between their other provinces. So they will prevent the flow of goods from one province to another to suit their own political ends, which can be a little crazy sometimes. And so it's actually easier and given the size of the country as well, as you can tell, it's the second largest country on the planet after Russia. It's a huge area of, of land uh, with you know, very small pockets of dense population but just getting products east and west across the whole of Canada can be quite a challenge. And so things tend to flow a lot more logically, a lot more frequently and easily north and south between different parts of Canada and the United States. Um, talking real quickly about the retail sector. The retail sector in Canada is, in my opinion, resemb it resembles very much of the Canadian economy. And I will say this a bit um, as, as an honest reflection on my time here, and that I believe personally Canadian consumers are willing to accept a greater level of protectionism in their market than American consumers would put up with. And that tends to translate into fewer options and not as good of pricing. Uh, and it's something that you will find when you're up here. Right now, the Canadian dollar is trading at about, you know, a dollar twenty, about $1.25 Canadian to one US dollar. So the US dollar is a little strong, which makes our exports, you know, slightly more dear, more expensive to the average Canadian consumer. But Canadian retailers, Canadian brokers, Canadian buyers on this side look to the United States for innovative products. They look for innovative packaging. They look for new and exciting things to bring their customers into their stores because 
the, the Canadian food processing and beverage processing space for as vibrant as it is, you know, Toronto is the, I think it's the second largest or third largest food processing hub in North America. Uh, for as much activity as there is in that sector in Canada, it is still somewhat protected and it does still suffer from some degree of that, you know, without as much competition, you don't have to, to try as hard all the time. So retailers, brokers, buyers, they like seeing US products. They like having something new and fresh and different to differentiate, you know, uh, their accounts here in the Canadian space. But when it comes to retail, there really are just five major grocery retailers and you'll see those logos on the top right hand side of your screen. Loblaws, uh, which is the largest retailer across the country. It is the largest grocery retailer. It's also the largest uh, drugstore. So Shoppers Drug Mart in Anglophone Canada uh, is, you know, uh, it's kind of like CVS back home in the States where like CVS is a national, you know, just massive going concern. Uh, Loblaws acquired Shoppers Drug Mart a few years ago and they've been moving grocery retail items into those convenience stores slash drugstore locations uh, at an increasing rate just to try to reach more customers with more products. Loblaws is a monster. Uh, Sobe's is another, you know, another, it's that number two, you know, retailer in the country. They operate under the IGA brand. They operate under uh, the, now it's going to be Farm Boy and under Longo's in the greater Toronto area. They, they have a number of different, and Safeway out west, they have a number of different locations, a number of different banners. And it's one thing that I will come to a little bit further on in the presentation, um, but Costco has been growing rapidly in Canada. It's been very successful. Canadian consumers, you will find are indeed price conscious consumers. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, Walmart still making, still gaining ground in Canada, but got off to a bit of a rocky start as a general merchandiser, but they're, they're picking up steam. So with only five major retailers controlling about 70 plus percent of the Canadian retail space, the, the, the retailers themselves have tremendous pricing power uh, and they have a lot of negotiating leverage when it comes to suppliers you know, coming out of the United States. And for first time, you know, exporters, for new to market exporters, um, I would encourage you to be very cautious about who you choose as a partner or when you're working with a broker in the Canadian market, and we'll talk about Canadian brokers, um, you know, make sure that you're, you're not always aiming for the big fish because a, a company like Loblaws will charge as much as, you know, $25,000 to, to get your product just on the shelf and that's per SKU. And so those kinds of, you know, listing fees can be really quite cost prohibitive. And one of the things that you know we've seen actually uh, in Canada over the last year has been that as e-commerce has grown, and mind you, it was only 2% of sales before COVID, and it's still less than 10% of grocery sales now even in the middle of COVID. Um, as e-commerce has grown, these retailers are trying to recoup some of their you know capital investments by charging supplier fees. So um, Walmart started out with it, and then Loblaws soon took soon after took it up. They charge a, a one and a half percent supplier fee on every product they're taking in, just to recover some of those investments, which has led to now really interesting. In the last two weeks, uh, Sobe's has signed on to a voluntary code of conduct with uh, the Food and Beverage Manufacturers Association up here to try to quell some of the consumer resentment that these retailers are really just exerting too much influence and kind of squeezing suppliers too hard. So we generally say to you know first time market entrants, don't look past the specialty and independent grocers. These specialty and independent grocers, while they're not gonna give you a national footprint, while they're not gonna give you, you know, massive saturation in sales, they're gonna be very open and receptive to new products, to taking a chance on something that you know, might be smaller shipment quantities initially, but if it sells well, they can be a real steady partner. I will talk about brokers real quickly. Uh, the Canadian market, maybe perhaps different from the United States market, perhaps different from other markets, really does tend to rely on the, the use of an in-country broker. And so there's a whole network nationally uh, specializing by region, specializing by category of brokers. And we will happily connect you with lists of these kinds of brokers across these different categories if you're looking to start you know, reaching out to people to form a prospective relationship. But these brokers really are the kind of gateway into the Canadian retail space. And they are your gateway into the Canadian market. They, if they like your product and they like working with you, and I, again, I encourage you, you know, interview these people, get to know them, feel them out, build a relationship, because these are the people that you're going to be really in business with and that are going to be integral to your success in this market. Um, they will be the ones who are going out and building accounts for you. They'll be the ones knocking on the doors of specialty retailers and independent grocers to get your products on their shelves. They're the ones who are going to be doing that heavy lift for you. So, Getting a uh, making sure that you have a relationship that you feel comfortable with, that you feel you know will you know 
align with your interests, align with your values is absolutely essential here. Um, and most Canadian retailers do not want to take on, um, you know, new products directly from a supplier, directly from you know, a U.S. manufacturer. Uh, one of the things that I know that was in the, the invitation to today's event was uh, non-resident importer status or NRI status. This is something that, you know, it's, it's a real specific kind of thorny thing to get into, but if anybody's interested, I will happily cover that in the Q&A section. So just feel free to ask me a question there. Otherwise, I'm going to gloss right over that one right now because I don't know that it's going to be as applicable uh, for folks that are just looking to get into the market. So what's making the Canadian market tick? We would say the diversity of the Canadian market is an absolutely essential thing to recognize and to capitalize on. Uh, in Canada, one in five Canadians was born overseas. They have a tremendous rate of, of immigration that is really sustaining their population growth rate. Canada is a country of only 38 million people. So it's growing uh, at a- uh, Mary. But most of that population- the to go to lunch now while they're out of sugar, than through, so that uh, when I get back, uh, they can start out. working. Just a reminder to keep your, your accounts on. Well, at, least, at least you'll be uh, on your- Obviously aging as well, uh, much like the United States. Uh, the Canadian population is growing, you know, older. And so you have older customers looking for increased focuses on healthy products, healthy living, lifestyle, and tend to have, you know, to be honest, a greater disposable income to spend on those products. So, you know, marketing towards that space of, you know, health and wellness is, continues to be you know, persuasive up here. And I can tell you on organic, uh, if any of you are organic producers, uh, the, or the demand for organic content in Canada is as strong, I would say, as it is in the United States, where in both markets, the demand for organic products outstrips supply by a great measure. And of course, COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on uh, Canadian you know, shopping patterns. And we see a, a lot fewer trips to the grocery store, much bigger baskets, similar kind of things as we, see, as we have seen in the United States. I will say, despite the numbers that I showed you earlier of Canada kind of moving into a third wave, um, Canadians have by and large, to my uh, you know, observation, really been quite, diligent about, you know, uh, following COVID-19 protocols in terms of wearing masks, in terms of maintaining social distance. Um, it's been, you know, uh, you know, I'm from the, the New York metro area, like I said, right. And, you know, my, my hometown was getting hit pretty hard early on in the days of COVID. And it was, it was tough to be up here where, you know, we felt relatively safe and my folks, my family were all kind of, you know, feeling a little bit, um, at risk. And so while Canadians have been really good about, you know, uh, following COVID-19 guidelines, people are getting tired of it like they are everywhere else. And I think that we've seen people getting a little bit lax and that's really what you see behind that third wave growing now. Um, although last summer things were better when the weather got warm and moist. So hopefully that'll you know help kind of keep rates down while we're waiting for the vaccines to show up. Other big trends in the Canadian market, buy local. I would be remiss if I did not mention the strength of the Canadian buy local movement. As I mentioned earlier, Canadian consumers and Canadians in general are fiercely Canadian and proudly Canadian. And one of the ways that they can really act upon that nationalist kind of sentiment is to buy local products and support local companies. One of the, the stories that we tend to trot out all the time is the, the story of French's ketchup. And you may be familiar with French's mustard down in the US. Well, I can tell you up here, French's is also a ketchup label. And back in, I think it was 2015, French's switched to using only Canadian grown tomatoes in the manufacturing of its ketchup. And it has eaten away at Heinz's market share every year since because they can put a big Canadian flag on the front of that ketchup bottle and say, proudly made with Canadian tomatoes. And, you know, I personally don't like French's ketchup. I wonder if, you know, if Heinz ketchup consumers are willing to just, you know, modify their tastes and preferences a little bit to be that extra bit of, you know, Canadian proud. But we have seen that kind of thing take place. And I have the Foodland Ontario logo down there in the bottom right hand corner, because that is, you know, it's a 50 year old logo this year, if I'm not mistaken. You know, they have been promoting local as we have in the States, obviously, with campaigns like New Jersey Fresh and, you know, all the other different state marketing programs. But they've been effective and nowhere is that more effective than with Canadian dairy. But I will leave that aside completely because if someone starts asking me questions about dairy, Naveen's going to start rolling her eyes because she'll hear me say way too much about Canadian dairy. Just be thankful you're not trying to export dairy products to Canada. And if you are, we'll have a separate call and I'll tell you all about it. Um, but buy local is super strong here. It's something that you have to be aware of. Something that, you know, again, if you are, you know, an American product competing with a very similar Canadian product that is in season during the same time, Canadians will often choose that local product. But like I said, they're also very price conscious shoppers. And so if you're coming in at a considerable price benefit, you know, maybe national pride has its limits. 
uh, plant proteins and clean labels, just like in the States, you'll see a lot of movement towards um, you know, the, the packaging having fewer and fewer ingredients, more things that people can read and pronounce without having a degree in chemistry. And on plant proteins, Canada is one of the largest pulse producers on the planet, chickpeas, beans, lentils, you name it. And they're doing everything they can to you know, really capitalize on their climatic benefits in growing pulses to, to drive um, innovation in the plant protein space. All right, moving on. How am I doing on time? Holding up, okay. Um, what are the US advantages? And so I put that, that table up there of the, you know, the top 15 or so product categories, just to give you a sense, not only of how much we are selling into Canada, but also the market share. And so prepared foods, this is off, these are the things like, um, like finished products, like consumer packaged goods that are on like center aisle shelves. You can see US out of imports, United States products, US origin products make up 80% of the Canadian market, right? When it comes to you know fresh vegetables, we're sixty percent of you know the Canadian you know imports of those. Um, we have just a really easy time connecting with Canadian buyers. It's not to say that success is guaranteed in the Canadian market. It's just to say that the Canadian buying side is very familiar with the United States. Um, and again, when it comes to when it comes to you know getting export experience, and if you're new to export in particular, you know I would just kind of not necessarily to caution you, but just to you know point out that Canada, again, it's not a huge population center, but you have high disposable income. You have a few little areas you can target on in terms of, you know, concentrated population centers. So you can limit your, 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 your entry point into the market and you can have success. You can get your sales. You can get that familiarity, that experience of logistics and working across borders and dealing with customs duties and dealing with all the, the myriad other headaches that can come with exporting in an environment that is on the same time zone often enough that speaks the same language that shares a similar culture and where if you have a question you can pick up the phone and ask right? and it's super easy to get a hold of people on this side whether it's through the canadian border services agency or you know your buyer broker partner so what are u.s advantages in this market again unparalleled cooperation the united states and canada have a food safety systems recognition arrangement which means that the united states government and the canadian government have evaluated each other's food safety systems and said we're about equal. You know, we have maybe different ways of getting to the, the finish line, but we have very similar outcomes. And therefore, we have a lot of confidence in your system. So you will never have a Canadian food inspector ever come to look at your facility if you're exporting to Canada. They don't feel they have to. It's one of the things they can pass on. You'll also have far lower inspection rates at the border. So God forbid anything ever does happen with your products, um, you're not going to be subjected to, you know, a greater rate of inspection where you might have, you know, either spoilage loss, whatever happening at the border. Um, again, United States, we got tons of, I've talked about a lot of these things. So I won't go through them all one at a time. Um, I will point out the USMCA, if you're not familiar with it, it's the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, which is the agreement that succeeded and replaced NAFTA, the North American free trade agreement. And under USMCA, virtually every single U S product other than dairy products, chicken meat and eggs and Turkey, um, will come into the Canadian market duty-free tariff-free. There is a process to you know, claim uh, what they call USMCA certification of origin, but it's super easy on your export paperwork. There's just a couple of pieces of information you have to make sure are there and a simple declaration. And when your product hits the border, no tariffs are assessed, no duties are assessed. It goes in like it was going into another US state, which is a really great thing for us to have. Now, mind you, Canada has struck free trade agreements in the last five years with the European Union who has a very large presence in the Canadian market and European Union food processors look at the Canadian market like we do as a high value, you know, high disposable income consumer that's easy to access and that has, you know, certain cultural and, you know, heritage affinities and ties. Canada has also struck free trade agreements with the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries. These are, you know, nine countries uh, outside of Canada, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, Chile, uh, Peru, um, Crikey, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, others uh, that are, you know, also competing in the, the Canadian space. So while we do have a dominant market share in Canada right now, I will say that competition is only getting, you know, more intense. And so it's a, a market that you have to, you know, continue to, to be active and to pursue. And again, this is not to tune around horn, but the foreign ag service, you know, and our three offices in Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal, we are a resource. We are a benefit. We are somebody uh, that other countries trying to sell into this market don't have. And I encourage you to look at our reporting and we'll get to that in a bit. All right, how do you get into the Canadian market? Real quickly, we've kind of covered some of these things already. I will point out on the right-hand side of your screen, you see Loblaws right at the top, right? And then you see all these other logos that are there. 
That is to give you a sense that one retailer in this market has you know, about 17 different banners that it operates because they regionalize, they go specific, and they go down market. In Canada, something that I was not really familiar with or prepared for as an American consumer, Canadians are very comfortable in a discount grocery retail environment. And they will often eschew the higher end, fancier, you know, Loblaws. I can tell you, Loblaws ain't fancy. Loblaws looks like a Kroger. It looks like, you know, a Safeway. It looks like your average American, you know, run of the mill grocery store. But Canadians will often go, you know, down a rung to, to seek a better price. And that better price may be a matter of pennies and nickels, but they will do it. And so you'll see things like no frills there. Um, Canada, actually, I should say Loblaws in particular, is famous for the popularity of store label brands. So private label products sell very well in Canada. Again, almost exclusively on that uh, that price, you know, sensitivity, you know, point. Um, there's a famous Loblaws brand called No Name, and I should actually I should incorporate this into the presentation in the future. But literally, their packaging is all yellow, and if it's popcorn, it says popcorn. And if it's butter, it just says butter in a black sans serif font. And it's super basic, super no frills. It's, it's what they, 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 they build their brand reputation on. It's a funny thing to see, but um, yeah, it sells pretty well up here. So if you're looking to come to Canada, what should you do? First things first, talk to your state, talk to your marketing directors, talk to the team in your state that can support you and assess your company and really get to know whether or not you are ready for export, whether, you know, diving into the export game is the right thing at this time. Uh, and then they will work and they will connect you to resources like you have here with Wusada. One of the things that I would point to, uh, especially for the Canadian market, is that behind the Wusada firewall, you'll see a, a product called the Doing Business in Canada report that we uh, developed back in 2019. Uh, that is a tremendous detailed manual, basically, on the, the operations and the mechanics of the Canadian retail grocery space. And I encourage you all, if you're considering, you know, your, your export journey in Canada. As you start that, read that document. It's like 60 pages long, but it's absolutely worth it. It'll give you a great sense, I think, of how things really work at the nuts and bolts level. Uh, you'll also see behind that firewall um, certain uh, market reports that we're just actually developing right now and hope to provide to Wusada in the next week or two. Um, these kind of specific city market reports for Vancouver, for Toronto, Montreal, and Halifax. Halifax being out in Nova Scotia, if you've heard of it but don't know where it is. Nova Scotia is way out there on the Atlantic side on the East Coast of Canada. Um, so they get the, like, Wusada, your states, that is the place to start. That is the place to really kind of get your, you know, your export readiness level up and to, you know, start doing your research on the market. And to continue doing your research on the market, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to go to the GAIN system. Uh, this is something that USDA provides for free to you as exporters and unfortunately to the rest of the world too. Uh, but we provide reporting in every country where we have an office. So like I said, 94 or 94 offices in 74 countries, we are producing gain reports about that market. And specifically in the Canadian market, I, or for any market, I should say, generally, I would highly encourage you to look at the exporter guide and the FAIRS report. That's the F-A-I-R-S. And we can send both of those to everybody that was on the call today. That's the Food and Agricultural Import Regulations and Standards Report. These are the two basic primers that we provide to the market for you know, understanding the market and accessing the market. So if you, all you have to do to find these reports is just Google like FAS or USDA and then gain and then a country. And you will find like a, just a slew of these reports that are out there. Every year we do marketing reports on the hotel restaurant institutional sector, on the retail sector and on the food processing and ingredient sector as well. And these annual marketing reports, you know, they have a great summary really of the industry, what's going on in the industry, what's hot, what's moving, what's going, you know, in the, in the years to come. So please, please, please look at some game reports, read them, get a better sense for things. I think you'll find them very helpful and very informative. Next step, finding a partner, finding a broker. And here are just a couple of, you know, of the really big honking brokers and food distributors that are active here in the Canadian market. And so I list them only not because I'm endorsing them as the U.S. government. I endorse, you know, no services here in the Canadian market. But just to give you a sense that there are these large brokers, some of whom have, you know, operations like Cisco, obviously, on the U.S. side of the border as well. You'll see a lot of crossover sometimes between Canadian and U.S. operations, certainly with multinationals. But finding a partner, like I mentioned earlier, getting the, the right relationship, building that right relationship, establishing whether you're going to approach, you know, the, the, the greater Toronto area first or Vancouver first, 
or whether you're going to go for a, an Eastern Canada regional approach, whatever it's going to be, that's the kind of conversation that you're going to have with your broker. That's the kind of relationship that you need to build and have those you know, open, honest conversations about what your goals are for the market, what you hope to achieve in the market, where you want to be in five years, and whether they're the right person to help you get there. And last, but certainly not least, learning the rules of the Canadian market. You'll see the Canadian Food Inspection Agency logo down there. They have a great, great series of tools that you'll find in the FAIRS report. Uh, one of them is called the AIRS, the Automated, Automated Import Regulation System. Uh, that'll tell you what your product needs to do, what, like what the access is for your product, if it even is exportable to Canada, and then what kind of documentation would need to accompany that product coming into Canada. They also have a great food labeling tool. Um, so food labeling in Canada is different from food labeling in the United States, right? And your labels, if you're going to be going into retail, need to be compliant with Canadian food labeling requirements. Luckily, getting a new food label or devising, designing a new food label, printing a new food label is one of those costs that can be reimbursed under the 50-50 cost share program. It's one of those things that I would highly encourage. You know, if you're looking at this market that you work with, you know, a labeling consultant, you find somebody who is, you know, qualified to say, yes, 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 you are hitting all these points, but you can begin your education process on the CFIA industry labeling tool website that is really, I have to say, very helpful when it comes to understanding what the labeling requirements are for products coming into the market. One last piece on health claims and health, you know, on labeling claims. Um, Canada is a lot stricter on labeling than we are when it comes to what you can say and what you can put on a package. So just take that as a, a, a cautionary note. What does the foreign ag service provide for you here in Canada? Research, the reporting that I mentioned earlier, trade leads, we will happily connect you when, and connect with your uh, state directors and with Musada when we have leads coming out of the Canadian market, you know, for you know, different buyers, different brokers, different retailers looking for different products. We will send that information down to the states. They can reach out to you that way. Um, trade shows, under pre-pandemic times, we would normally have a U.S. pavilion at Seattle, Canada, the biggest trade show in the country, or CHFA East, uh, the Canadian Health Food Association, big trade show that happens in September. This year, both trade shows are going to be taking place, CL Canada and CHFA East are going to be taking place in Toronto. Are U.S. exhibitors be able to get across the border to actually represent their products? We still don't. With a, a note of caution. Trade missions, a lot of times, ah, sorry, you'll see that, uh, USADA, the different SRTG partner states, will do trade missions into Canada and then bring Canadian buyers down to the United States. If you have a chance to participate in one, I highly recommend it. It's a great way to see the market, get a feel for it, better understand it. Um, whole host of activities that we do under the Taste USA umbrella that you can find on our Taste USA website and you can see in our digital media channels. We do recipe you know, developments, videos, promotions, you name it. There's a lot going on in the Canadian market for sure. Who do we work with? Well, obviously Musada, but these are some of the trade associations that I was mentioning earlier that we partner up with on promotions in the Canadian market. It's a whole host of U.S. products. Like I said, over 40 U.S. agricultural trade associations are actively promoting U.S. products up here. We got a lot of great partners, and there's a lot of marketing opportunities to team up with. And that is the end of my presentation. Realizing that I wanted to give you all at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Sorry. Well, Evan, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate that. And so, um, Eric, I'd like to turn it over to you as our uh, MC. Yes. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, if you do, um, feel free to um, raise your hand or put something in the chat. Um, I know we didn't prepare you for this ahead of time, but um, let us know if there are any questions. You know, Evan, one question I have is you mentioned um, how closely um, Canada has um, relationships with the European Union. And so in regards to um, more of the sustainability and kind of green direction that EU is moving, is Canada on a kind of a similar trajectory, trajectory, I guess? So yeah, the EU influence in the Canadian market is something that I have to say, um, we watch closely. Uh, I will say this, you know, the, the, the separation between agriculture production and consumers in urban areas in Canada is no different from the US, right? And oftentimes you find that these population centers can have maybe a, a disproportionate level of influence over policy and over rules and regulations. Right now, the current government in Canada is very attuned and dependent upon um, 
downtown Toronto and downtown Montreal voters for its, you know, uh, political success. And so when consumers in those areas get a notion in their head about food or agriculture, no matter how fantastic or ridiculous or unfounded it may be, it can have some influence. And it's something that we saw up here recently with Buttergate. I don't know if anybody on the call was aware of that when it happened, but it was one of those things that kind of made the, the rounds on the US nightly um, comedy shows because Canadians were complaining about their butter being too hard. And it's, it, there, there's not a whole lot of basis in that, to be honest, but it's one of those things that, you know, it was a national sensation. Um, so while Canadian consumers may be leaning a bit more uh, European in their preferences and the way that they say, oh, you know, I really want, you know, all my food to be produced, you know, with draft animals and no irrigation. Um, Canadian consumers are not yet willing to pay the prices for what those products would cost. And so I will say that we don't want to, you can never deceive a consumer. You don't want to be like actively deceiving a consumer. But I will say that if you look at a, con a consumer's preference in Canada, I don't see them as markedly different from the United States. I don't see the Canadian consumer being the type of consumer that looks at a geographical indicator, something like prosciutto di Parma, you know, like a, a, a specific product from a specific place that's hyper local as being kind of the be all and end all. Um, they really are a cost, like in broad, broad strokes, a cost conscious consumer uh, that is looking to, to, you know, keep an eye on their, on their, their wallet uh, more than they are trying to shop with their, their values and their hearts. But when you ask consumers, when you survey consumers, absolutely, they will say, you know, sustainability is important. Canada, I will say much more than the United States is very attuned to climate change. Um, this is a country where, you know, winters are less severe or less, you know, cold than they used to be. And Canadians see that, you know, I, I you know, all my you know, Canadian friends up here, you know, especially the ones over 40, they're like, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's no doubt in climate change. I mean, my God, we used to be waist high in snow this time of year. And now it's like, you know, barely at my ankles. Yeah. Climate change is real. And the thawing of permafrost in the North of Canada, you know, uh, polar bears, not, you know, making it across the ice anymore. These are things that impact Canadians directly. And I will say, you'll see it in the way that they're treating plastic right now. They're, um, you might've seen some news about them banning six items, including plastic straws, plastic cutlery, kind of coffee stirs and things like that. Canada is more environmentally conscious uh, and they're moving, I think, in an environmentally, you know, aggressive way, but not, but they're very respectful of trade and cognizant of the fact that they are still a country that depends on imports for their food security. And so they're not looking to cut off the taps, even if they're looking to maybe move in a, a greener direction. Sorry if that's a little bit meandering and a whole lot of nuance, but it, it's it's not so easy to say, yep, Canada equals Europe or no, Canada equals United States. No, um, not at all. And uh, kind of on a similar uh, note, I guess, is a lot of companies that we speak to um, sometimes are, uh, Costco is a great instance. Um, I'm a supplier to Costco. I mean, how is it if I'm a supplier in Costco to be a supplier in Costco in Canada? I mean, it just seems like, is that something that's just an easy transition or is there some hiccups in that process? No, that's a great point. Um, so the buying for Costco Canada and Costco US are separate. You know, you'll have to, to, to make those representations, the same kind of information and numbers that you would provide to Costco USA, you're gonna need to provide to Costco Canada to really, you know, make sure that you can land that account. And from my understanding, there isn't a whole lot of like Costco Canada calling up Costco USA and saying, oh, that's working out well for you. Okay, we'll give it a shot up here. It's really on the, the company and the product itself. Um, but we have seen, you know, there are a lot of US products in Costco Canada that have had a great deal of success, certainly, you know, in the produce side of it, but also on the consumer packaged goods side of it. So it's definitely an option. It's definitely possible, but same as in the US, Costco does exert a lot of pricing pressure on U.S. Supp on suppliers, so that doesn't change when you cross the border to Canada either. Perfect, thank you. And I think we have a question in the chat. I don't know, Eric, do you have that? Yeah, the first question was, can you share this deck with the group? Yeah, absolutely. So I will happily send this to, to you guys, Eric, and, and to Josh, and you can you know loop it around. And I'll send you, like I said, the, the exporter guide and the fares report and those things too. Um, we'll, we'll send you the full package of things that we uh, we think would be great for the people on the call. Do you want me to do the one on, on the CBSA advanced ruling for butter based? And I yes, would say, yeah, so um, advanced Thanks. rulings are a great thing. CBSA offers them. 
you will find the links in the FAIRS report to how to you know, secure an advanced ruling from the Can sorry, CBSA Canada Border Services Agency. It's the corresponding agency to US Customs and Border Protection. They're the ones who do the harmonized schedule uh, tariff classifications. So they say, yes, your product is this based upon the ingredients, the, the name, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore it would be classified as X. And based on that HS code, it would be duty-free or it might be caught under one of these really unfortunate dairy codes where you know, you're gonna have to come in under a import quota or be charged 290% tariffs, whatever it is. Butter-based, I can't say without knowing what your product is, but by all means, please email me, email, uh, you know, we have you know folks on this side of the border that will take a look at what your product is, what percentage of milk fat, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll try to give you a sense. And then I would say certainly look at doing a CBSA advanced ruling if you're not sure. That is the best way to have 100% confidence because once you have that advanced ruling in hand, if anything ever goes wrong at the border, you say, no, 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 you said this, and they're going to follow it because that was their own determination. So yeah. And then is Montreal uniquely different than the rest of the country in buying? Demographics, more European centric. It's a great question. Um, culturally, Quebec is distinct from the rest of Canada in every way. Quebecers and the rest of Canada don't always mix, to be totally honest. It, it, it's, it can be a little oil and water sometimes. And you know, it's mostly because Quebecers are francophone, right? By and large, they are like there are so in Montreal, 25% of the city of Montreal is English first and in the home but 75% of the city of Montreal is French first. And the rest of Quebec is pretty much all French first. And so to succeed in the Quebec market, you can't just take your, your, your English language marketing stuff, tra Google translate it into French and think that it's gonna carry through. You have to understand the Quebec consumer. You have to work with somebody in the Quebec you know, market who knows Quebecers and can speak to Quebecers. And even if it feels a little funny, you gotta have confidence in your, your, your counterpart in Quebec. Um, because they're going to know what's going to work well in Quebec and what's going to resonate in Quebec. And as, as an American, as an English speaker, there are certain things that I see, I'm like, no way is that really, that's what we're doing in Quebec. And so it's like, trust me, it'll work. And lo and behold, it, it tends to, to land really well. Um, so yes, Montreal in particular, it is, I would say Montreal consumers have more of a cultural affinity for European products because of their, you know, heritage, obviously. The, the, the Francophone Canadians, I find, are more connected to the continent of Europe than the rest of Canada is on a cultural and on a, you know, kind of, you know, emotional level. So while they, and they have more trade relationships with France and with Italy and with other countries too. You know, we sell, Quebec is the largest wine drinking province in Canada. It's our third biggest province for exports because the Quebecers drink a lot of wine, but they're mostly drinking French and Italian wines and even Spanish wines before they drink U.S. wines. So we have our work cut out for us in Quebec to really reach these customers. But I think mostly it's because we haven't gone across the border to, to, to make those, those inroads yet. And I feel like once we do, you know, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity there. Uh, research on the different markets, demographics. Yep, we'll send you those, uh, the city reports that we developed. Those I think I'll be really helpful. Specialty and ethnic products, absolutely. You have a large number of um, South Asian, you know, there's a big South Asian population. So I'll just say there's over 13 different ethnic groups in Canada that claim more than a million people each. So country of 38 million, right? With 20% of those being foreign born, you still have, you have 13 million people identifying as a specific, you know, individual ethnic identity. And, you know, Chinese Canadian, uh, Indian Canadian, uh, certainly the subcontinent of, of India uh, is a you know, big source of population here in Canada. A lot of Caribbeans, um, certainly in, in Quebec and Montreal, you see a lot of West Africans because of the, the Francophone ties and the French language ties. So yeah, absolutely products and an increasing number of Latin Americans. They're not nearly as Latin American, um, there, there isn't nearly as large of a presence of Spanish speakers or Latin Americans in Canada as you would find in the United States, but the numbers are growing. Um, tips or thoughts on seasonal quarter four products in the Canadian market. So uh, quarter four, I presume you're thinking, you know, October through Christmas. Um, man, that's a, a good question. I will say Canadians do. So this is something you'll always hear with the, the dairy side of things. They buy more cheese in the winter. Canadians love cheese, eat lots of cheese, even if it's, you know, mostly just Canadian cheese. Um, they, they, they tend to stock up on like the calorie dense foods in the winter time when it gets cold out. Uh, so if you're, if you're in that kind of a, a product line, you're probably in good shape. Um, you know, people gift food up here, I think 
more than I was, you know, uh, familiar with in the States. And I, I feel like it's the kind of thing that's certainly around the holidays, you know, buying somebody something that they can enjoy and consume that, you know, they can experience as a, a novel, you know, kind of, you know, taste or flavor um, is something that would, you know, certainly do well in the fourth quarter. But certainly around harvest time, you know, you have to be aware that, you know, during Canadian peak harvesting season, uh, it's only a little bit behind our peak harvesting season. And so if, if you're talking about fresh produce, you know, we may be able to, um, we call it the shoulder seasons, right? On the front end and on the back end, we'll extend their season by a little bit, certainly for things like, you know, um, blueberries, right? But, you know, or for apples or for whatever it's going to be, like we can have a, a bit of a longer season than they do just because of our uh, geographic range. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're talking about that third quarter there, you're getting into like, you know, citrus season, you're getting into those kinds of products there. Um, which can be, you know, they're just not available locally. There is no Canadian citrus, just as there is no Canadian rice. <laughs> um, Evan, you uh, spoke about earlier about the importer kind of distributor role and how important it is in Canada. Um, can a lot of times companies, um, I think, have are not expecting kind of what happens when they discuss with an importer distributor. I mean, there's usually, oh, there's going to be a fee for me to represent you. Here's yep. kind of an agreement. Can you kind of talk about that, what it is to deal with importers and distributors? Yeah, in sure. The um, that's a great question, Josh. Thank you. And so generally speaking, when you're talking to a broker, um, like again, like brokers are, so in Canada, you have distributors who will basically be the warehouse and they'll move your product around, but it's the broker who's really out there, you know, putting, you know, shoe leather on the ground to, to build accounts and to build your sales. And those brokers will often, you know, operate on a retainer system for the first couple of years or until sales reach a certain volume where that fee structure will then translate to a percentage of sales. Um, oftentimes it's around 5% of sales, but that's just a rule of thumb. You know, it depends on the broker. It depends on the relationship, the product, the market, you know, how hard they have to work to get accounts, et cetera, et cetera. But don't be surprised if a broker, you know, expects you to pay upfront uh, an annual retainer fee for them to try and pioneer your product and to introduce it to retail accounts and to try to get you sales in the market. Um, they're providing you a service. They are your sales force in the country and they should be paid like a sales force in the country. Um, and then again, like when it moves into that percentage base of sales, that's something that you, you know, will negotiate with your partner. And this is why we try to underscore, you know, finding somebody with whom you have a, a good solid relationship, you know, that you feel you communicate well and clearly with is really just, it's, it's, it's so much of, uh, of what it takes to, to be successful in the market and to have, a relationship that will work for you for the long haul. Perfect, thank you. Well, it looks like we're coming up on time here. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll make sure that um, I, I'm able to connect you um, with the, the Canadian team. And we're looking forward to you know, working with you all here coming up in May again, and we'll have more um, information uh, about the mission um, next week. So thanks again for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Josh. And please, 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 please. <laughs> Thank you, intern. I forgot, Lucas, awesome. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if any of you have any questions at all about the Canadian market, uh, please do not hesitate to send us an email, pick up the phone, give us a call. Naveen, Arella, myself, uh, we are more than happy to help you work through pretty much anything. That's what we're here for. Perfect. Thank you all so much. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.